The following is a performance of the Response Podcast, recorded live at the Reverberation Festival in Northern California. Debuting an excerpt from Voices of the Response, a reimagined version of the podcast for live theater, we shared the stories of two undocumented immigrants from the aftermath of the Tubbs fire and how, in the face of ICE raids, labor violations, and a housing crisis, the broader community came together to stand in solidarity with those who are being forced into the shadows. It was just before 10 p.m. on the night of October 8th, 2017, when the Tubbs fire ignited by the failure of a private electrical system in Calistoga, California. Hurricane force winds whipped through the blaze through the Mayakama Mountains, fueled by this bone dry landscape, still recovering from a five year drought. It only took a few hours to reach the city limits of Santa Rosa, where as the city slept, it jumped Highway 101 and continued its deadly march through the densely packed neighborhoods of Fountain Grove and Coffee Park. I was working in Healdsburg. I was coming home back at 11 o'clock at night. I came in. I just went right to bed. The kids were sleeping and I was sleeping and I was just tired. I just never thought that the fire would jump all of those freeways. This is Pastor Al. He was living in Coffee Park. A little bit after 2 o'clock, I heard the phone ringing. It was the police department saying, you know, get up and get out now. The smoke was so thick that night. And, you know, I was like, okay. I said, we need to leave. I opened the door and I was shocked, you know. And the wind and the fire was all over the place. Survival was the only thing I had on my mind. Al woke up his wife and kids, and they rushed to get out. The only thing he had time to grab was his daughter's asthma medication. As they made their way through the thick smoke and floating embers towards their car, he suddenly noticed that his wife was missing. And I started calling my wife, and, and then I heard my wife was knocking on, on one of our neighbors. He was about 74, 75. And all I remember, I heard my wife calling, get up and get out. And my wife went to four or five other houses. She was to knock on their doors. And I was like, man, get up and get out. So she came and we went. As they scrambled through the smoke-laden streets, the houses around them were already starting to catch on fire. Eventually, they made it out of their neighborhood and headed south on Highway 101, where they ended up pulling into a Home Depot parking lot. And so that's where we hunkered down for the night. You know, we were just waiting until we see what we can do the next morning. Like many of the 20,000 undocumented people living in the area, Pastor Al and his family avoided going to official shelters. Immigration and customs enforcement raids and deportations are something that this community has to deal with on a daily basis. And the possibility of federal agents at shelters made them nervous. Many folks ended up just sleeping on the beach or in their cars. When Pastor Al and his family were finally able to make it back to their house, everything was gone. You know, all of it. I mean, there's nothing. We looked around, you know. We were shocked. I mean, all you see there, we just stood there and cried. I mean, it's like... My goodness, everything was burned to the ground. I mean, the metal, it is unreal. And I think to us, it was that my son came up and showed me this ceramic that was given to us by a friend of ours. And the only thing, the reading on the ceramic was Luke 1, 3, 7, that nothing is impossible with God. That was the only thing that survived the fire. I said, this is the one thing we are going to hang on to. And I guess that's part of our story. So I walked out. I said, okay, it's the only thing I can hang on. And that it was the only thing that survived the fire. Everything else burnt. Here's Irma Garcia, who, like Al, 
is an undocumented immigrant and also lived in Coffee Park. Estábamos dormidos durante los fuegos. We were asleep when my neighbor came and knocked on the door at three in the morning and told us there was a fire. We got up and just grabbed the basics and went to the veterans building. The Santa Rosa Veterans Building had been set up as an official shelter. When Irma and her family arrived, they quickly noticed that the whole system was a mess. They tried to offer their help, but the Red Cross staff just brushed them aside. Still, they couldn't just sit idly by. And so despite everything that they were going through, they found ways to make themselves useful. But even as they were helping to set up beds and clear out debris, they felt un unwelcome. The Red Cross staff had begun ordering Irma around in a way that made her feel uncomfortable. And one of them had actually yelled at her five-year-old daughter for being in one of the beds that Irma had helped to set up. Mi hija was five years old and she hadn't slept and she had behaved very well. So I told her to rest in a bed. And I said to the lady from the Red Cross, please do not talk to my daughter like that. No hablas así a mi hija. And she said again, get out of the bed and get out of here. And then my husband said, we're leaving. Estamos mejor afuera que aquí. So we left and we were going to spend the night in our car because it was so sad to see what was going on in the shelter. And as I was leaving the building, we looked in, around and I realized that there were no immigrants. There were only citizens, Americanos. There were just a few immigrants, but they were outside or in the corner. That was when I realized that our immigrant community was suffering a lot during this disaster. And to this day, todavía están sufriendo. The disrespect and hostility that Irma and her family were subjected to at the shelter was one of the most traumatic parts of their experience with the fire, especially for her daughter. And though their house was spared by the flames, the hardships were really just getting started. The fires had a big effect on us because we couldn't work for three weeks. Imagine, tres semanas sin trabajar. So we fell behind on our bills and on rent because rent is so high. And then on top of that, we had to deal with the fear of ice that we wouldn't be able to work. Or if we did go to work, they'd show up and take us away. Aprendimos todo sobre las experiencias de las personas en nuestra comunidad. We realized that many undocumented immigrants were sleeping in their cars or were going to the beach at Borrega Bay because they didn't feel safe in any of the shelters. They didn't provide any help for us and we didn't trust anyone. No confiamos en nadie. We didn't trust the law, much less the police or the sheriff, and we didn't trust FEMA because FEMA also discriminates. So we went to seek out stories, and as we learned about the experiences of people in our community, empezamos a contarles a otros las historias. We realized that our people were suffering a lot, and our children, too. So that's how UndocuFund got started. And pasó con Omar Medina. He was the one who helped us through all this, along with the rest of the community. They started fundraising, donating, doing events. Ayudó a mucho gente. But many people still didn't trust it at first. It's difficult to give your information when everything is connected to everything else. So the last thing we wanted to do was to give out our information to keep ICE far away from us. This fear was also present for Pastor Al. At first, he'd have avoided applying for UndocuFund as well. We were just worried about who was going to be controlling that information. If we're going to put our names out there, you know, where is it going to go? That's the other side of it, that I think I've withheld this whole idea of going to them. I just didn't know what, you know, it's, I know, I know it's undocufund, but I just thought, you know, how, how are these things going to be worked out? Who is going to be handling this information? The undocufund has shown us what can be achieved when we recognize the needs and worth of everyone in our communities. All told, over $6 million has been raised from at least 8,000 donors and distributed to more than 2,000 undocumented families impacted by the fire. As terrible as they can be, disasters present an opportunity to expand our social imagination and dream up new possibilities. Perhaps these events can open up a space that is normally closed off, a gap in which we can begin reclaiming a community agency and power 
an opportunity to tell a different story about who we are and what gives our lives meaning and purpose. As an undocumented immigrant, you realize that lo, la policía, the sheriff, the system, everything, todo, we are outside of that. Estamos completamente excluidos. But when UndocuFund started and we saw so many people helping from all kinds of different places, we realized that although we are outside the system, we are not outside the community and that the community supports us. We know now that at least we are not alone. No estamos solos. We were very grateful for the help. The help that helps my family especially get situated, the food, the clothing, and that part of we were very grateful for the fund that was given to us. I think what I discovered is that in these kinds of situations, it's nice to have a place where you can go and sit. You could hear others. And by talking about, I think it's so therapeutic. It's so healing when people can understand and listen to your stories and even just, you know, that, that you can express your emotions and your feelings. I think it does something to all of us. Thank you.